Next up is Managing Director and CEO of Chalice Mining, Alex Dorsch. Since joining Chalice in 2017, Alex has led the company through an exceptional growth period. His leadership has been recognised through multiple awards, including New and Emerging Leader of the Year by Mining News and CEO of the Year by Kitco. He has a diverse range of experience in a, in a variety of leadership roles across the resources sector, management consultant, engineer, project manager and corporate advisor. Please welcome Alex Dorsch. Thanks, Digby, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, great to be back in Kalgoorlie for this fantastic forum. Uh, so presenting today on Chalice Mining, uh, as it says there, you know, we're really opening up one of Western Australia's more exciting new mineral provinces. Uh, and uh, as it says there, it's really focusing on nickel, copper and PGEs. The usual forward-looking statements, competent person disclosures, these are available on our website should you wish to read these in full. Uh, so who is Chalice? Chalice is an ASX 200 green metals explorer developer and we really have a track record of creating uh, a, a significant amount of value for our shareholders over the space of the last 15, 20 years. Our purpose has really been fine-tuned to really play a key role in decarbonisation, finding these metals which the world is going to need in very large quantities to decarbonise the global economy. And our aspiration here, based on what we found on the western part of Western Australia, is to create a new world-class multi-district green metals province in the western part of the Yilgarn. Obviously, coming out here to Kalgoorlie, you can feel that that job has been done over the last 50 or 60 years uh, out here in the eastern goldfields. We're really trying to replicate that success in an entirely new uh, and newly recognised uh, part of Western Australia. Uh, and it's very proximal to Perth there, as you can see on the left-hand side. So we, our portfolio is, is twofold. We're focused on our Gonville Nickel Copper PG project, obviously a discovery in 2020. We're advancing that project uh, towards development. Uh, and then around that, uh, we were fortunate there was a lot of vacant land when we, uh, when we made that discovery. So we staked the vast majority of that land holding there over about 8,000 square kilometres in the West Yulgarn. And really that remains a key focus for us to sort of find the next one and then hopefully the next one after that. But first of all, the, the Gonville project, obviously our project is a, is a significant one. It really is differentiated by a couple of things. Uh, the, the proximity to Perth there, about 70 kilometres northeast of Perth, uh, and the secondly, its size. So it is a tier one scale magmatic sulphide resource. It contains 16 million ounces of precious metals, 860,000 tonnes of nickel, 520,000 tonnes of copper, and 83,000 tonnes of cobalt, a very, very substantial amount of metals in anyone's language. If you like to think in nickel terms, it's equivalent to a 3 million tonne uh, uh, contained nickel nickel equivalent or a 30 million ounce palladium equivalent deposit. Uh, and then importantly, it also has a high grade component to it, which extends from near surface down to about 800 metres. Uh, and we recently made some extension to that, uh, to, to that mineralisation there at 800 metres, which I'll speak to. Uh, and all of that remains open. So it's a very, very exciting new start to a, a, a significant scale uh, uh, development. Uh, so it's a strategically sized resource, uh, obviously very relevant mix of metals for decarbonisation, but also we shouldn't forget urbanisation of the world's population. So typically, you know, moving, people are moving from regions into cities and they become much, much more metals intensive consumers when they do that. We own 100% of the project, it's entirely on chalice owned farmland, so our resource really we're focusing on developing that on our farmland. It has significant upside, like I said, and that proximity to Perth comes with a very, very um, advantageous uh, uh, set of infrastructure, as well as obviously the large and highly skilled Perth workforce. So we're exploring the, the area around our, uh, our discovery uh, and developing that, uh, that deposit. Uh, and then something that's obviously gaining a lot of attention is uh, we opened up uh, a data room recently to uh, really look for uh, strategic partner partnerships uh, and that process is well underway. So um, I want to talk about geopolitics first. So Gonville is already a strategic asset, but you could say that really it, it is a bit in, in a class of its own relative to other you know, recent discoveries. And when you put in context the level of dominance 
that Russia um, and South Africa have on the PGMs, so palladium and platinum. They really produce almost the entire world's uh, supply of those metals. Uh, but then you look at places like Indonesia and its dominance now in nickel. These are big issues for, for Western economies and Western automakers in particular because they're completely reliant on jurisdictions that they do not really want to do business with. Uh, so we here in Western Australia, obviously, we're a fantastic, stable democracy. Uh, so we are very, very, our products from Western Australia here are very attractive to larger Western customers. Um, so I guess that has driven us to look at strategic partners uh, alongside, I guess, the scale of the development that we're considering here. Uh, but things like the US Inflation Reduction Act have really sort of spurned unique levels of interest in, in assets like this. So the, the need to decarbonise, it is a global challenge and that it's not going to be sort of the just the first phase of technologies, it's not going to be the first phase of, of wind turbines, solar panels, electric vehicles, it's the sustaining that level of metal output over to create the second phase and third phase and so on. So these are very, very metals intensive technologies. As you can see on the, on the top there, hydrogen, electric vehicles, hybrid vehicles, they all need a lot of this metal. Um, so I think probably the most topical recently is uh, particularly around hybrid vehicles. People would be familiar with Toyota's original approach to this, uh, to electrification. They were somewhat hesitant to a, um, push to a 100% electrification of their vehicle uh, product line. Uh, and they have been recently joined by Ford in really sort of doubling down in the areas of hybrids. I think people have come to the realisation that pure battery electric vehicles for the entire planet is just not feasible. There is going to be too much uh, demand there for, and, and too little supply to go around. So I think it's very interesting to see that hybrid vehicles are starting to take a bigger and bigger role. Uh, and that's, uh, the, that demand level for metals to, to do this decarbonisation is, is a challenge when you look at just how prolific the world was at exploring and finding metal back only sort of 50 or 60 years ago. So as you can see there, in the 1950s through the 1970s, we were finding metal every day of the week, dozens and dozens of tier one uh, types of discoveries. Obviously, they, most of those discoveries are still in production today. They are the big foundation mines. We had a little bit of a spurt in the, in the late 90s, 2000s. And then really since the, since the China boom has finished in sort of 2011, 2012, exploration expenditure has fallen off a cliff and obviously the discovery rate has gone down to negligible. So since the world galvanised together, you know, signed the Paris Agreement uh, that the, the world was committing to decarbonise, there's only been seven giant base metal discoveries in that last eight years. Uh, so it's quite, quite a problem for the world in that it, I guess the easy finds are gone and that's what makes Gonville even more, more uh, rare and special. So the, the Gonville resource, this is a schematic on, on, a, on the right hand side here. Uh, as you can see it's constrained largely to a pit which is uh, two kilometres in dimension. Uh, the resource is defined to 800 metres below surface. I mentioned the contained metal numbers. This is a, still a work in progress after drilling about 1100 drill holes, about 300,000 metres of drilling we're still defining more and more. Uh, so located on Chalisone farmland. Uh, and it's at the resource pit shell there, I guess most of this resource will be open pitable. As you can see, their low strip ratio of 1.6 is quite unusual to see things of that size with such low strip ratios. Uh, it is very, very large. Uh, it's the second largest nickel sulphide. So if you just consider its nickel content alone, it's the second largest undeveloped nickel sulphide resource in Australia, second only to West Musgrave. Obviously now that's part of BHP's portfolio. And you can see there's a quick, there's a big gap down to the next biggest uh, in, the, in the space. So these were some recent results uh, that we uh, announced uh, just last week. So we, we, the resource, like I said, it remains open down dip. We've got four rigs continuing, continuing to drill on it. Uh, and even before we consider the potential sort of in the region along the strike length, this thing is going to grow substantially just you know, before we leave the boundaries of our farmland. So as you can see there on that image, that's looking to the southwest. Uh, down the strike length of, of Gonville there. You can see that we, drill, we drilled a hole uh, at about 1,200 metres 
uh, and that was about a 900 metre step out down plunge of the, of the resource. And that's hit some very high grade copper and PGE mineralization at the basal contact or the foot wall of the, of the intrusion there. It's not so much you know, what's the significance of those hits by themselves, it's the fact that there's hundreds and hundreds of meters of, uh, with no drilling in the surrounds of those results. And we're now stringing them together to some very high grade uh, zones that we've you know, hit in that 300 to 400 meters deep. Uh, closer to surface. So really now it's driving us to, we're seeing grades at depth that are sort of between four and five times the, the, the pit, uh, open pit resource average. And that's driving us to look at early underground scenarios now. So bringing maybe a decline in, in parallel to the development of the open pit. Uh, and really that would be targeting those, that mineralization that extends there from 400 meters down to now 1100 meters. But as you can see on the right hand side of the page, there's still a lot of more dip extent that, uh, that can be added uh, here. So there's another 1.6 kilometers of the Gonville intrusion modeled beyond the limit of the resource. So th the, the other unique thing about our resource is that it has this significant development optionality. So as you can see here that the grade tonnage curve, depending on the economic conditions of the time and largely commodity prices at the time, the benefit of having these large shallow resources is that you have a lot of flexibility in terms of the scale uh, and the nature of the development. So we've now selected two open pit development cases uh, for the upcoming scoping study. Uh, they've obviously been updated to incorporate the, the resource update that we, we, we updated in March of, of this year. Uh, and that scoping study is targeted for completion this quarter. So you can see there that I guess the, there's a, that level of optionality, that's one of the, I guess, the unique things about this, uh, this style of deposit. What processing we're envisaging here has been the topic of a lot of different option analysis, if you like, over the space of the last 12 to 18 months. I guess we have landed on this as a preferred flow sheet. Um, this is basically a two-part two flow sheet, if you like. The first part is a fairly conventional flotation process to concentrate the copper and the majority of the PGEs uh, into, a, into a copper concentrate. We plan to sell that copper concentrate to a copper smelter, get very, very attractive offtake terms for a product like that. It's going to, as it says, there be somewhere around 20 to 25 percent copper between 100 and 150 grams per tonne of PGE. So it's a very, very high value product. Uh, and that's going to be shipped to an international copper smelter. On the nickel side, I guess we have some, uh, a small amount of the PGEs as well as the cobalt locked in the nickel minerals. So we're looking at not only floating that nickel and concentrating that nickel uh, and cobalt and remaining PGEs, but then doing some hydrometallurgy on that stream. And given the scale of the resource base that we're talking about here, we're sort of underpinning you know, potentially decades of life uh, for an operation of, that, of this nature. We believe that, that hydrometallurgical examination and investigations we're doing today is, is very much warranted. And that will allow us to bypass the nickel smelting market uh, and then go directly to battery customers. So the lithium iron industry is screaming out for precursor nickel cobalt uh, in a form from a Western uh, ESG friendly source and in a form that they can utilize. So we're planning on producing a mixed hydroxide precipitate of that nickel and cobalt, which we will sell and market to a, uh, a battery customer. Uh, and work is really focusing now on trying to categorise each different part of the deposit. Um, given that it is a magmatic system, it does have some variability. There's, a, there's a, an order of magnitude difference between the highest grade mineralisation in the deposit and the lowest grade mineralisation. So we're really now focused on characterising that deposit and continuing to assess you know, where is the optimum mix here, what is the optimum product mix to, to sell these, uh, these metals. Uh, and alongside that, we're committed to strong environmental stewardship. I guess given the location of the asset, it goes without saying, this is a very unique opportunity to prove that mining can coexist with uh, proximal communities and an environmentally sensitive area. You look at operations like Boddington, 
Acadia in New South Wales, very, very similar uh, type of uh, situation. You've got towns and, and environmentally sensitive areas very close to those operations. We're really f following the, the strong lead of other you know, performers like that in the, in the, in the industry. Uh, we've already committed to a, a very ambitious biodiversity goal of no net loss of, uh, of species or habitat as a result of the operation. So we've already demonstrating that and alongside that we've already done effectively two years worth of environmental baselining to support all the regulatory uh, permits that we're going to require to, to mine Gonville. And then I think the other point is about the community benefits. And you obviously, you know, in a place like Kalgoorlie, it's very, very relevant. You know, you can imagine what Kalgoorlie would look like without the super pit. It just wouldn't exist in anywhere near this uh, this level of prosperity, or this level, uh, this size of this town. So, I guess with it, it demonstrates uh, long-lived operations of scale can add significant benefits to local economies and and the the, the proximal communities. Um, so we're very much demonstrating that already. We've already got a, 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 a very high level of spend in the, in the communities and we're really doing some modelling at the moment to demonstrate you know, what that will look like to, to the surrounding economies over time. We're also building collaborative relationships. We've already got a very strong relationships with the Wajuk and Yuwad traditional owners, uh, and that really f forms the foundation of, uh, I guess, uh, you know, what we're planning to do forward. They're already very much involved in uh, in surveying and monitoring of activities within the Julemar State Forest, immediately north of Gonville, uh, and I guess we we plan to really strengthen those relationships over time. The current resource though, if you look on the left hand side of this page, I'm sure people have seen this image before, the, the Gonville deposit and the resource occupies just two kilometres of strike length. And this is a 30 kilometre strike length complex of intrusive geology. Uh, we've already drilled, uh, uh, as it says there, about 110 drill holes along the strike length to going north of the, of the deposit. And we've intersected some very interesting mineralisation there in identical geology to what we see at Gonville. So we know that at least 10 kilometres of that strike length is mineralised. I guess you know what's probably most exciting is that that next 20 kilometres we're going to be drilling in this quarter. We're going to start uh, drill, drilling those Bodan, Jans, Torres targets along the right hand side of that page later this quarter. So very, very exciting stuff uh, given that none of it has been tested before. Um, the, the, I guess the drilling at Hooli on the left hand side of the page there gives you context of sort of how far away these, pro these areas and how big this system is. Hooli there is very exciting because it's giving us a thickening of that prospective geology at depth. Uh, and we're getting some very interesting high grade results there, albeit narrow uh, at the moment, but it's really vectoring us to go deeper and deeper to try and find, I guess, that central part of this, this magma flow that, that was responsible for Gonville. Uh, regional, that regional exploration drilling, like I said, this, later this quarter, the scoping study, which is not far away now, this, these are key catalysts for, for Chalice uh, in the coming months. Obviously the strategic partnering process as well, we are well advanced with a, a range of parties there, to, we're in discussions with in industry participants all the way from end users right back to the, the mid cap and large cap mining houses. Uh, and those discussions will continue and really we're looking for the technical and development expertise to, to help us maximise the value of this asset. Uh, and then the Gonville discovery obviously we made in 2020 is really just part of our portfolio. I guess you know we are very confident here that this is not an isolated occurrence of magmatic sulphide mineralisation. These things typically do cluster in camps of deposits and we're in a very fortunate position there that we basically own all the surrounding land 100%. Uh, so we have, over the course of the last 18 months to two years, uh, done loads of uh, geochemical sampling, geophysics. We've really sort of thrown the kitchen sink at the province. Uh, and we've now really got to a point where we've got a lot of drill-ready targets. As it says there, 10 of those are going to be drilled starting uh, uh, this week. We've got a rig that's just mobilised uh, to, a, to a regional target. But as, I guess, cropping activities uh, uh, commence uh, later this year, the, the rig will effectively you know, gain access to, 
to those farms, and most of those targets are on uh, existing cleared farms, uh, and then we'll go and drill those, which is obviously very, very exciting. The prize here is, I guess, more of what we found at Gonville when we started that, that 3% nickel, 1.2% copper, 10 grams per tonne PGMs. We, we believe, yeah, I guess, this system, this, this, uh, this province is capable of delivering metal tenor uh, or sulphide tenor like that. So that is obviously a, a very, very attractive prize to go uh, hunt in the region. So to summarise, I guess, you know, we've got a world-class, very, very unique asset. It's a tier one scale uh, resource, which is, which is very, very unusual in the Western world. Uh, it is a, a very unique, highly leveraged uh, commodity exposure, and it's really the right commodities uh, given the thematic that we're looking at at, at the moment globally. You've got a team with a track record of delivering and, and adding value, uh, and then the, the level of exploration upside here, obviously the portfolio has quite a unique level of exposure in terms of upside to, to a completely new mineral province over in the western part of the state. So, uh, so thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much, Alex. I think we've got time for one question which has come through online. When does the next phase of drilling start and what are your priority targets? Yeah, so like I said, the, the regional targets um, are sort of surrounding within 50 kilometres of, of Gonville, that, uh, that drilling is underway at the moment on one. But there's another handful of targets that will be drilled sort of over the course of this half. Uh, the, the state forest, the, the next uh, permit for, for drilling in the state forest, we, we anticipate very, very soon. So we'll be doing some air core and some diamond drilling in that region uh, later this quarter, like I said. Thanks very much, Alex Dorsch. Thank you.